The future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. Hi, I'm Puck Lowe, a filmmaker, researcher, and writer. You're listening to The Next World, a podcast about building movements. Every month, we'll celebrate and be in conversation with the work being done by poor people's movements, especially in the US. We want to highlight organizing led by women, queer people, and people of color who are pushing forward new models of systemic change. We're going to be speaking with Diana Nusera, a community technologist, artist, DJ, and musician, and Jenny Lee, the executive director for Allied Media Projects. They're both based in Detroit, a city that's seen a lot of infrastructure collapse and a lot of resilience and imagination over the past few decades. Welcome to today's episode of The Next World. Dee, how are you doing today? We're so thrilled to have you. <laughs> I'm good. It's so funny to hear all, all those things because I swear they connect in some way. <laughs> in all of the best of ways. Yes. I am so psyched to get to talk with you about a subject that I think needs a lot of discussion in this moment, which is surviving the apocalypse, but not how you think. I'll just say that maybe a few years ago I was in this book club and we talked about, you know, the imminent collapse of the world and all of the infrastructure and we kind of made this informal, unbinding group suicide pact, which was not what I expected from the book club meeting at all. Like, it went from how would we survive to like, why would we bother surviving? And mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was kind of like, well, if we get to the point where we, where we have to eat human flesh to survive, I just opt out. So that was kind of where I was at. And then, you know, over the last few years, especially since 2016, what's become really clear, at least to me, and I think to other people too, is that there's like a really large distance between survival and perishing. Like the apocalypse isn't this one time moment where then afterwards you know, it's, it's a different world. It's like a slow, steady collapse. And so, or not collapse, maybe that's even the wrong frame, but we talk a lot about this, Diana. And so I, I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, we do talk a lot about this. And I think it's because it feels more real than ever, you know, like climate change being a real, real thing, especially like with the rainforest on fire currently and like all of the economic, you know, BS we've been facing with the new administration currently. And it, it just feels like that on top of like real exploration in space, like people, it feels like people have been trying to find a new planet for a while. You know, and it, I know it could sound a little weird, but I just, I'm wondering what does it mean to be a generation that, like, really thinks that this could happen, if not in our lifetime, then our children's, you know? And so it just feels like upon us to, like, have to think about all these ways in which we, you know, do we survive? Do we not survive? What are we surviving towards? What What is even collapsing um, and is it even worth recovering, you know? So like, yeah, I feel like we do think through these things cause it's real and not to be like doomsday about anything, but you know, I live in Detroit. So like, I've actually seen the, what it looks like to have not a lot of infrastructure. And I think the ways in which we may not think about surviving the apocalypse are like where the joy is in it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's really easy to go into how devastating, you know, it, it would it would be. And I think that's inevitable. But what's not inevitable is like what happens after and what we do with it if we are to survive. Yeah. So I, I ran across this quote. It's a William Gibson quote, actually. And he is talking about the future. And he says, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And I just think it's I, I love that quote because it forces us to recognize that, you know, this idea of an apocalypse is flawed in the sense that it completely fails to recognize the ways that infrastructure is already breaking down, that people are already suffering from climate change and all of the things that, you know, are 
may be possible to ignore sometimes, depending on where you live. But let's say, you know, all the power goes out and let's start there. Power goes out. What happens next? Like, like what can we do? Well, I, I'm pretty sure like candles become important, <laughs> you know, I think we, we've done, we've, this has happened before, this will happen again, you know, like mm-hmm. we've evolved to this state of having power grids, this internet infrastructure, there's all, you know, these communication like devices and all this stuff and even mobility. And it, it means that we've been able to expand the things that we do, but it doesn't mean that we can't continue doing those things in a sort of smaller scale. So I think what happens when the power goes out, that your the scale of your community or your environment or like however you lead your life becomes a lot smaller and it's adapting to that. Like, so instead of calling to a friend on the other side of town, like you're now tasked with like knocking on your neighbor's door. Mm-hmm. So that, that's something that comes to mind. It's like, you know, the first, once the power goes out, communication what is happening and not to say we can't build our own infrastructure because we have that's what like wireless networks are great for is that you can still communicate without power if you have solar set up so I think like maybe the reaction will be what's happening where are my people and who's got who has power Mm -hmm. and what are some of the lessons we can learn from Detroit (laughs) <laughs> Some of the lessons to learn from Detroit is that there's mainly just being able to be a good neighbor and to create community with you know, within your surroundings. Because if, if the world does get smaller when the apocalypse happens and you don't have any relationships around you, then you're sort of isolated and stuck or you're starting at a, a, a zero rather than 10 or something. And I think that look, what I've learned from organizing in Detroit, that it's about building those relationships and then planning, like, where are we going to meet? Like, you and I have talked about, like, okay, like, I have what could be the equivalent of a small farm on, on my land in, in Detroit, which is, like, about seven miles away from Canada, which is walking distance, or even you could live off my land, depending on which, what kind of apocalypse it is. So how are you going to get to me? You know, Mm -hmm. I think that thinking about the larger scale communication and migration is something that I I don't know what that looks like, but I think what Detroit has to offer is what a functioning city looks like without resources. I mean, it may not look like functioning from the outside, but you know, it's, it's a beautiful city with amazing people and lively art and music. So we're doing something right, you know? Yeah, maybe um, maybe just describe what Detroit is like. Like what does not appear functional, but actually has its own sense of rhythm and order. Yeah, so Detroit looks like very different in each part. And I think that's what makes it unique. So there are neighborhoods that are, may look like a very large public park, but it's not. It's, it's just open land and fields. And maybe it's being taken care of by the city. Maybe it's being taken care of by the neighbors. There are also neighborhoods that are super populated that you wouldn't even think about that have the land or the sort of crumbling happening in it because everything you need is right there. And the sort of more of like the gentrification that's happening. And it seems like more and more folks that come in, like don't leave those spots. And so when they see the other parts of Detroit, they forget the collapse that did happen. Um, And so because of the lack of resources and, you know, little things like streetlights not being on for a long time, leading to like areas of crime and scary for people who like have to take the bus very early in the morning or go to school um, and it's still dark out and so things like that that have led to people building their own infrastructure my projects that I've worked on we're like I think second or third most 
least connected city in the United States, and we're a major metropolitan city, but so many people don't have internet connections that, like, because of the community organizing that's happened, which is really rich in Detroit because, like, that's what's needed when there's not very many resources. You know, we figured out how to build our own communication infrastructure. So I think Detroit looks like... I mean, that's wild. I remembered you once we were driving past the radio antenna and you, and you were like, we could just buy one of those. We could just make one of those. <laughs> I know. They're actually like, yeah. I mean, I really do think... I still think about that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Some of this is like, you are now responsible with taking care of your own needs and... If in municipal services aren't there, like we don't know how to tap into them because we don't know how they work because we take them for granted. Mm-hmm. So I think in my lessons, maybe from doing some of the wireless organizing in Detroit, that like the more you know about how these systems work, the easier it will be to like one, make them a little more diverse in ownership and, you know, create like the neighborhood based version of it. But two, where do you tap in to get water if the water goes out? Where do you go to get disposed of trash? Where is you know, like there's all these things that are not familiar to people because they don't they don't think about it. So we're about to be joined by Jenny Lee from Allied Media Projects who I think can bring some insight into this conversation on infrastructure collapse and rebuilding and building the shell of the new world within the old. Jenny, it's such an honor to have you as a guest. And Jenny is the executive director of Allied Media Projects in Detroit. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. We should take a minute for you all to describe your work and what um, AMP is, for instance, and like the Detroit Technology Project, like everything that we've kind of referenced. Okay, so yeah, Allied Media Project is sort of a hub for a lot of different types of activity at the intersection of media and art and technology and social justice. And we say we're cultivating media for liberation. And what that looks like is a million different things, but uh, we we hold a few different containers for supporting and incubating this vast network of work. So that's the Allied Media Conference, which is a big convening of folks in Detroit to Skillshare and build strategies and party and rock each other's worlds. And then there's the Sponsored Projects Program, which is a way to provide fiscal sponsorship. So a lot of back-end administrative support to people doing radical work and don't want to have to become 501c3s. And then we have a Speakers Bureau, uh, which is a way to get people's media-based organizing for liberation out into the world. And one of the oldest and strongest projects within our network is the Detroit Community Technology Project, which has been doing that really grassroots, neighborhood-based communication infrastructure building for about seven years now. So one of the big reasons that I really want to talk to you and Diana about this subject, which is surviving the apocalypse, but not how you might think, is based on how I met you, which, as you recall, is here in New York City when we were much younger and we were preparing for the Republic National Convention protests. And in that moment, I felt like it was perhaps grandiose, but I think there were real moments where we thought we would be able to rebuild or to build a whole new different kinds of communications infrastructure. And the internet was still kind of new. And it was like a very optimistic time. And then since then, I think we've, you know, we've just gone through so much in the world and then our lives and organizing and in tackling these larger questions of how do you build structures that do the, the political things you want them to do, especially when they start outsizing themselves. How do you deal with that? I would love to talk about the apocalypse in terms of infrastructure collapse and ideas on building and rebuilding them. Yeah. Well, but, I have one memory of that time, which then directly connects to Diana and Sarah. Yes. Um, 
on that theme. So, well, one, I think that when we think about like infrastructure collapse and creating new systems in, in their wake, it's helpful to think about what that looks like on small scales first and see what's possible and then more possible and more and more possible as one thing leads to another. And so back in New York in 2004, there was this, um, so we were building a independent media center, a makeshift temporary alternative communications hub that would last the five days of those protests, but also in the weeks before and after. And it was an empty entire 20th floor or something of some building on Wall Street. And you and some others had gotten wind of the fact that a a school in New Jersey had a stash of like a hundred semi-working computers in their gymnasium and had like been sent off to go collect them to bring the computers back to, to, to create this media hub and did that miraculously. And then we used those computers and then they ended up, you know, getting kind of distributed across the country to different uh, places, including to Detroit. Some of them are probably still in someone's basement somewhere. But around that same time, Diana was becoming more involved with the Allied Media Conference and spearheaded the creation of what we called the Media Lab, essentially. That would be kind of like a micro version of what we built during those protests in 2004, but also inspired by her work and youth media in Chicago. And, and it was this, this radical idea that we have what we need. Mm-hmm. And so the, you called it like a media potluck, where every year people coming to Detroit would bring some piece of media equipment and folks would use that all weekend long to make music and film and other yeah. amazing things. You know what's so wild about that memory, Jenny, is that it's so similar in the sense that like what you built what and what, you know, together in 2004 and then when we met in 2006 or seven, and then you know, I was like, had this same idea, but we had never crossed paths before then. But this idea of this is what we need emerged, you know, from a small town in Indiana where I was living and also in, you know, in New York City. I think that's, that's yeah. really interesting. Well, that reminds me of what we were just talking about, Diana, with, you know, we are already a part of nature. So the prospect of becoming part of nature or reconnecting to it is irrelevant <laughs> yeah like we have what we need like you know like the lifelong lesson of being able to share that i think is like what keeps us from maybe tapping into that with our with the tech i don't know say more about that was so rad the tech potluck that jenny was describing was so radical at the time because tech was just like thing that you you know, wasn't really in under-resourced places. So, like, you hoarded it. Like, you didn't, you know, you wouldn't leave it in public. You, you know, it was very much a security around a material object was a culture existed. And the fact that people would drop off, like, their works, you know, like, what they needed for their programs into a space with strangers they had no idea and allowed hundreds of other strangers to use it, too, and then hopefully be able to take it back home undamaged at the end of the weekend was you know, kind of a lot to ask in hindsight. <laughs> but it was the radical action of, of like liberating technology. So it wasn't this thing that we hope so precious, like gold or silver, that it was just this normal sort of these devices that we could use to create together. That, that was really radical back then. Right. Yeah, yeah. for sure. I think about that now and I'm like, oh yeah, we would have, we would have been needing like to put locks on all that stuff and like, but we needed, but we would need people to like fill out liability um, releases and forms and things like that. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, it's, but initially it's just like, it requires that kind of lack of concern for the risk and liability to kind of have the experiment succeed at that scale. And then, and then, then as things grow, they have to, you have to navigate new new kinds of questions like that. It, I feel like it takes away the scarcity mentality. You know, like that's, yeah. that's the like that's the goal there. How to like decentralize things to to take away the scarcity mentality because that, that's what creates like crime and violence. 
I think that's yeah. key to reframing the apocalypse too. I think as humans, there's such a long-standing tendency to look forward to the apocalypse in some weird way, either through some odd retributive like ideology, you know, like we all quote get what we deserve. But I think on the flip side of that, it's more like just an interruption. And so the left has been obsessed with the breakdown of society for ever, really. And I wonder if this is part of it. It's like an excuse of how to interrupt that scarcity mentality. You know, and so so yeah. I guess it's like how do how do we kind of prepare for that and like already prime ourselves and the places where we are at to respond in a way to crisis that in a way that is not about scarcity, but in fact is the opposite, like what you just described with the technology. Yeah, and I feel yeah. like Jenny, like the work we've done together for so long, like the past decade has been about like really teaching people to collaborate and to create these like, like to show what decentralized systems look like. Because what we know is, and I feel like the queen of that, like you are so, it, it comes so naturally to you and how to think about how to distribute like responsibilities and, and like create structures that don't have central nodes. Um, and like, I'm yeah, just curious to think about like what you think that role of decentralization will be in the apocalypse and what it will look like. I think to the idea of being infatuated with civilization collapse and everything, I think, you know, there's like part of what's really attractive to that is the idea that there will be this moment when all of the, the norms fall away and it's like, it will have to be a, a moment, right? Like it's it's a brief opening where the norms, whether they be like individualism or scarcity or risk management, all of that shit just like doesn't exist for for a while in order to to really imagine and, and recreate new ways of being. But then that moment will end and there'll be this re re solidifying or reforming of policies and systems and you know, have to hope that like in that reforming, it's a much better, healthier, more beautiful thing. But, but yeah, I think what, what, to what you're saying, do you like what we've been when working, been working towards, because we've had the gift to be doing the work that we do and being politicized in this place called Detroit, where we, you know, did experience some version of collapse of the kind of capitalist industrial economy white supremacist society of that kind of lasted up through um, the 50s and 60s here and then and then Detroit was in you know this reconfiguring mode and so that I think taught me and you and like a lot of our generation of young um, activists that it is possible to to recreate things and, and imagine new systems and new ways of providing for what we need and the way that I see it most exciting right now this idea of like just decentralized more decentralized and kind of community rooted forms of infrastructure in particular is in the realm of utilities because that's a thing that so Diana's work with Detroit Community Technology Project kind of like seeded for, for us at AMP, at least this idea of like, oh, we can have very hyper-local neighborhood-based internet service providers. Like you don't have to be, especially in the absence of a Comcast or an AT&T and these companies that have visually redlined whole neighborhoods of Detroit, it's possible to create community-owned and governed internet infrastructure. And seeing that idea ripple out in different ways to like, well, what other forms of utility infrastructure could be decentralized in that kind of way and also building on just the the kinds of infrastructure people have created to respond to things like mass water shutoff so we the people of detroit which has been just redistributing water to thousands of people in the event that they've been shut off from water and those that's the social form of infrastructure of like humans delivering water bottles and knowing their neighbors and assisting in that way. But um, I think we see more and more people here thinking about how that social infrastructure can be the layer upon which actual utility infrastructure gets 
reimagined and built. One of the things that I'm so curious about and thinking right now is how can people start doing work to not necessarily plan for the apocalypse, given that it's already happening, although unevenly distributed, but at that sort of regional and infrastructure level that is right beyond the sort of like, you know, just coordinating with your neighbor, kind of like what you were mentioning about utilities, like what are other projects you've seen that take on that kind of scale and scope and an attempt to create community control over these things that we depend on for life? Well, I will say that AMP was part of a collaborative process earlier this month to request $100 million (laughs) to to scale up what that looks like in Detroit. So the basic framing was that the climate catastrophe is, is hastening on more and more people are going to be moving to Michigan, to Detroit, because of our relatively high elevation, our access to the Great Lakes and all of our aquifers. And that right now, Detroit has this brief window of time in which to set in place systems, policies, infrastructure for being both resilient in the face of climate catastrophe and just and equitable and community governed in all those realms. And so the premise of that was saying like, this is already happening. The exciting thing is that there's this this brief window, but so much is already being seeded in the realm of communications, water, alternative energy. So there's projects like um, Solar Neighbors and Solidarity, which are comparable to what we were talking about with the neighborhood-based communications infrastructure, but on the level of solar energy infrastructure. And then the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, which is opening up a food commons that's going to be a distribution point for food that's grown all over the city in a cooperative grocery store. So it was basically saying like all these little things are, you know, not not so little anymore, but medium sized things happening. And and with an infusion of a hundred million dollars, we can scale them up and also kind of link them together through knowledge sharing around cooperative business models and community utility governance models and also pushing for the kinds of affordability legislation, things about the energy industry, the energy utility industry that I don't even begin to understand, but people who work on those issues do in ways that that would need to be regulated and policies that would have to change. So that's exciting and also an opportunity to kind of like connect with the places around the world that are even in more advanced Mm -hmm. phases of this situation and have undoubtedly models that we can be learning from. Part of the the research I was doing in that sort of like, what is that intermediary level between very small scale community organizing at that like potluck level and then at the like massive governmental level, which will not at all be working most likely. Um, and the event of like a true crisis, then like what is left, you know? And But that led me into this sort of wormhole with, well, how are governments even thinking about collapse and crisis and, or how Wall Street is thinking about it and how like municipal governments are thinking about it is by insurance. And so there's, there's a, a thing called a catastrophe bond, which became popularized after Hurricane Andrew hit Florida in the 90s. And before that point, insurance agencies against that underwrite catastrophe just assumed that they would always be able to cover whatever and they just didn't really think about it and so it wasn't until that moment where someone was started applying risk modeling like using computers to to guess really or to to make predictions about whether or not a a giant natural disaster would happen and what makes that so different is because you can't predict a giant disaster by using historical data, especially in the era of climate change, as we know. But so catastrophe bonds were this like financial instrument that was made up at that time to insure the insurers. So anyway, that was this kind of wormhole that I went into about like, well, how was the government and how are rich people like thinking about the apocalypse and planning? And that's that's what they're doing. (laughs) So... Um, so, of course, it brings up all these larger questions about, like, well, what should we be doing, you know? Um. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It's like you have to kind of 
think about it and what will happen and then bet on the thing that people will want the most or need the most. Mm-hmm. It's Which such, is probably going to be water. Yeah. Medicine. You know? Yeah. Well, that I think that'll be the, the start of it. I mean, we should already know we've hit a certain stage of the apocalypse because there's so many. I mean, even California was about to have like a major water crisis and probably is on, still on verge because like you guys dipped into your aquifers after the uh, the drought. And then you have like India is dealing with so much stuff around a drought you have you know like we are close and I think that'll be like when that scarcity mentality against water hits like that's when we'll we'll know we're we're in it earlier this month the UN um, released a report saying that unless climate change is reversed we're definitely gonna have food scarcity from that effect Mm -hmm. so that's terrifying which is already happening and I think that all of this happens if we rely on a centralized system. Climate change is going to be inevitable, whatever we do, something's going to happen. It's like, you know, it's already happening. It's going to be another generation before we feel any of the work that we do on it. I don't know, I'm just thinking about, sorry, I started getting freaked out and lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Oh my goodness. There's this uh there's this thing that the we the people of Detroit who works on water rights issues here and their collaborator called the Charles River Watershed, they have this thing called the Quirk, which is a community water energy resource center. And it costs like about ten or twenty million dollars to build one of them. And so if we get this hundred million dollars, we're gonna build one in Detroit, mm-hmm. but it's like a wastewater treatment facility that also provides energy and it like creates energy and it and fertilizer or something and it uses human waste and I don't know it's but it's the kind of thing that is a it serves as like a wholly independent capacity for serving I don't know what the range is maybe like depending on the size of it like a small municipality or a neighborhood of a city so I think things like that that are of a larger scale than just a in-home gray water system or something, but more decentralized than a municipal scale, such that there could be more community control of that infrastructure is interesting. Yeah, that coupled with like the keep growing Detroit stuff that's going on, you know, where they have, I realized that they have, I think it was like 1600 community gardens throughout the city that they, you know, offer plants to for 10 bucks a month. I think, you know, you start thinking about those community programs and like what they're sort of preparing people for. And I mean, I love the quirk that killer. And that's something that's like, You know, we figured out how to use wireless as a communication device and a community organizing tool. And then there's all these community gardens and it is like the electricity and water that is unhacked or still to be hacked. You know, we didn't talk about jewelry. Jewelry. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because like the one thing is that when you're in the midst of freaking out, like, what are we going to do to keep people from, like, hurting each other and, like, re- like part of the scarcity mentality thing? I think one of the layers of that is joy. Hmm. That's the one thing that we didn't really talk about was, like, how are we going to be able to, whether you want to call it joy or love or happiness or stability, mm-hmm. mental, mental stability, they're all the same thing in, in the case of an apocalypse, so... I mean, you could grow marijuana, but, you know, some people, it freaks them out. So it's like, I keep, you know, wondering about mental health in the case of the apocalypse. Something we didn't talk about. Yeah, no, we can't do anything else if you don't have that. But I yeah. wonder if working on these things, like being a part of a system that you create is what is enough. Hmm. You know, going back to the village and everyone has a, a role in it. If that's what keeps 
mental health? Well, I think, yeah, like what we, what we said in this $100 million ask was like our relationships are our most basic form of infrastructure. And so to the extent that they, you know, the current infrastructure is, is a reflection of very broken, exploitative, violent relationships that have been structured over decades. And that it should be no surprise that some people have their water shut off in that context. But, but yeah, like to what you're saying, you can't have efficient, equitable, smooth functioning utility infrastructure relies on the quality of human relationships. You kind of can't have that without attending to mental health, interpersonal dynamics, conflict resolution, trust building, communication, all of that stuff. All that stuff is crucial for apocalypse planning, I would say. Yeah, maybe the most important thing. Yeah. That's the system of collapse that we can't let happen because that's when you've lost. And you might as well just do the suicide pack that you started with the show with. <laughs> that was the, uh, there's, a, there's like a James Baldwin quote where he says, the moment we break faith with one another, the sea engulfs us and the light goes out. So on that note, it was so good to talk to both of you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us, both of you. Yeah, this um, was fun. I really, I can't wait till we get to talk about this again. <laughs> Thank you again so much to our guests, Diana Nucera and Jenny Lee. How can people see more of your work? Well, I am no longer at the Detroit Community Technology Project, but I am very much active in preparing for the apocalypse, both personally and through zine making. So <laughs> you can find me um, with my handle is at Mother Cyborg. Awesome. How about you, Jenny? Uh, folks can, yeah, follow the work of Allied Media Project at alliedmedia.org. To close out today's show, our minute of resistance. The thread that runs through the Allied Media Conference is media-based organizing. And the first part of that is really thinking about media as any way in which you communicate with the world. So that can look like your clothes, it can look like the way you write, it can look like coding, it can look like filmmaking, it can look like dance. The AMC is different from any other conference. What it essentially is, is a, a collaborative work experience. People come here, uh, they train other people in basic techniques, they get together and actually imagine. Like a geeky, diverse, political, expressive arts conference. Allied Media Conference is the most crucial, visionary space for media-based organizing cultural work across the intersections of many different movements from prison justice, LGBTQ and you know, trans work, two-spirit work, uh, environmental and ecological justice. Basically, this is a space where you come to become transformed. Thank you. And thank you, everyone out there, for listening to this episode of The Next World podcast about building movements. You can find out more about us at nesri.org. That's N-E-S-R-I dot org. And thank you to Jesse Strauss for sound mixing. Keep building and until next time. <laughs>